Hi, this is Paul. Sometimes I put a project on hold and I come back to it later, partly because I learn more. And this is true of the Easter message that I'm not done with by any means. I was in the middle of the sacrifice portion, if you go back and find the, the last video in this. And quite a bit has happened since then. And I continue to learn and I continue to pick up new things that come along. Uh, yesterday someone pointed me to the Sam Harris Bart Ehrman conversation, which was really interesting, and so I'll probably talk about that more in the future. Uh, it gets into my conversation about worldviews and the Bible, and it's it's gonna it's gonna go into this one. Now, the Jordan Peterson's Easter message was was quite interesting, and again, I'm not done processing it, and I'll, I'll continue to work through it. And I also go back to things I talked about quite a bit further ago, and this was an interesting conversation with, with Tim Lott and Jordan Peterson, so I want to play the first beginning of it, because how Jordan Peterson views God and how we can construe Jordan Peterson's relationship with Christianity is continues to be a fascinating topic. Okay, um, quick question, are you a Christian? A quick question. <laughs> I suppose the most straightforward answer to that is yes, although I think it's it's Let's leave it at yes. Which is funny because in other interviews he says no, and that's of course a big debate. And so let's 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 have them unpack this a little bit. Well, there's, I, I, I'm a bit dissatisfied with that because there are so many kinds of Christians, and well, I, I I would never imagine that you were a very literal-minded Christian. Well, there there are there are truths other than the literal that perhaps are more truthful than even literal truths. You know, there are many kinds of truth, and, and, and I don't mean that in a, I don't mean that in a postmodern way, actually. But the truths that govern behavior and the truths that emerge from facts are not the same truths. But you don't, do you, do you believe that Jesus rose again from the dead? Literally. Big pause. He's a smoke burning. I, I cannot answer that question. And the reason is because, okay, let me think about it for a minute, see if I can come up with a reasonable answer to that. And in many ways, I've been doing videos for now about six months, and this continues to be an issue that stalks it. And I've been learning about phenomenology, and we've been processing all of this, but you'll notice that in the Sam harris Bart Ehrman conversation, it gets into that question. Well, the first answer would be, it depends on what you mean by Jesus. A historical human being that existed. In a body. And in a body. In a body. And yeah. that it was a physical body and that it was on earth. Yes. That it was on earth and that was literally, uh, was literally, um, uh, it came back to life. And, and so again, if you watch the Ehrman thing, you'll... You'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Someone asked if I could do a whole video on it. I don't know, maybe. We'll see. But, okay, so so the point about the body. And when you get into Ehrman and, and Sam Harris, now they're both, to, to frame it a little bit for you, they're both um, modern materialists. And that's Bart, Bart Ehrman was a fundamentalist Christian. Now he's a modern materialist who has particular ideas about the resurrection. Bart Ehrman himself believes that the disciples thought they saw something, but our Bart Ehrman, on the basis of his philosophical convictions, being a materialist, in fact, in the podcast he says blatantly, you know, miracles don't happen. Well, once you buy that, then dead men stay dead then you need another account for Jesus' resurrection. But see, Peterson doesn't take that. Peterson doesn't go there with that. Peterson, if, if Tim Lott had been talking to Bart Ehrman or Sam Harris, they would have simply said, no, Peterson doesn't go there. And, and again, I think people look at this and say, well, he's playing games with us. He's not playing games with us. And the more I've studied Peterson, the more I understand his phenomenology, the more I understand where he's coming from. It's, it's not because... It's because reality is a much stranger place, and consciousness is a much stranger thing for Peterson. And again, we've been talking about that quite a bit in the process of my videos as I've been going through. After death. 
I would say that at the moment I'm agnostic about that issue. And again, my take on Peterson thus far in terms of how to describe him is he is an open agnostic. And I, and I say that to contrast him with, let's say, someone who is leaving the faith, um, and they're leaving the faith for a variety of philosophical reasons. So one of the things I wanted to get into when we, because I want to dig deeper into Peterson's Easter message is because he's got to talk about the resurrection, he's got to talk about sacrifice, is the question of who God is for Peterson, how we can understand God given his philosophical assumptions. And so I wanted to do a video on kind of the history of God walking through the Old Testament a little bit, walking through church history, Christian history, Western civilization a little bit with respect to this question of, of who or what God is. Which is a lot different than saying, I don't believe that it happened. That's and very I can't, interesting. I can't explain why. I, when I get to the when I get to the New Testament in my biblical lectures, I'll spend like six hours trying to explain what I think about that. Now, now we know he doesn't get out of Genesis in his first fifteen, and being someone who preaches through the Bible, I can tell you it's a long book. And depending on what he decides to do with the Old Testament. Again, in terms of many Jordan Peterson fans, they're very much looking forward to him resuming this. He's been on his book tour. A lot of people are wondering, is he going to resume it? When he's going to resume it? I think he is going to resume it. When is, is an open question because he's got himself booked um, through 2018 into 2019. How long there will be interest in his book tour? How long, you know, this this current manifestation of the Jordan Peterson thing is going to go is a hard thing to say. But, you know, again, one of the little interesting things that came out in the Bernie Schiff piece that came out last week was he wanted to buy a church building. Well, when I read that, I thought that makes perfect sense. And in a conversation on Facebook in the Jordan Peterson study group, I think that's the group, there's so many of them, you know, I made the point that Peterson is fundamentally a religious social figure, not a political social figure. I don't think he's going to run for office. He doesn't fit well into the Canadian political spectrum. Being a politician involves a lot of what probably doesn't interest Peterson. He's interested in politics, but again, it's he's working at a different level, and I don't think this is this is the path he's going to pursue. So, so we get into the Jordan Peterson, and people will say, well, what do you believe in God? And he always says, I'm annoyed by this, and it depends on what you mean by believe. And that's the easier part of the equation to figure out, because then when he says it depends on what you mean by God, we're going to take a lot more time to work on that, because that's where it actually gets interesting. That's where his philosophy matters. Now, one of the things that, as I as I look at Peterson, and we kind of go through the history of the Christian God in this video, and this is going to be a long video, so I know some of you are happy about that, some of you are frustrated by that, okay? What you're going to see is this relationship between religion and philosophy that, that is ongoing, and, and those are the frames that we tend to look at it through. Well, believe. Peterson is a pragmatist, and we look at Jonathan Haidt's Rider for rider and the elephant. The the riders chatter, and the riders talk about all kinds of things. Well, I believe in this and I believe in that. But if you look at the whole unit, the whole team, watch what the team does. So watch what the elephant does. And the elephant is a lot stronger than the rider. The rider tries to guide the elephant, but the elephant often will go and do what he wants to do. Now preachers say similar things about the Bible. Preachers will often tell people. In fact, a dominant thing that preachers tell people is you don't believe the Bible. You don't believe in Jesus. Um, and one of the one of the one of the one of the ways now believe is a tricky word too because um, pistis in Greek is we translate it two ways we believe and trust. And that then gets into a big a big bifurcation in the history of Christianity in English between these two aspects of the Greek understanding of of pistis, believe and trust. So believe Peterson often critiques as this is merely profession or Christian confessional beliefs versus trust. And so one of the ways that I talk often as a preacher 
if I'll say, well, what is a Christian? A Christian is someone who believes, excuse me, a Christian is someone who trusts in Jesus more than they trust themselves. And, and that kind of gets to the chase because trust involves both professed belief and action in terms of how we actually live our life. So the Greek word is actually a little bit more rich and full. Now, now Peterson will often, in a sense, when he says belief, I don't, I don't worry about that. I would have to ask, does the writer count for nothing? And I don't think it does. And I don't think it even does in Peterson's realm because obviously free speech is a big thing for Peterson because what the writer says actually does matter in terms of how the writer interprets his experience. His or her experience could be a female writer. Um, Peterson is against compulsory speech. And, and the truth is a lot of speaking is, is thinking. And so speaking your beliefs, even if you can't act them out, is an important step in thinking. His biblical lectures are an activity of thinking out loud for him, and he's trying to figure out what he believes about the Bible by talking about it, which is really very similar to my project here. There's, there's regularly comments, uh, why don't you get to the point? Well, I'm not at my point yet. I'm, I'm thinking out loud, and those of you who enjoy the channel obviously enjoy thinking out loud. Those of you who are looking for quick summations, you're probably going to have to look elsewhere. And I think, generally speaking, writing is better for quick summations. Talking is better for, for thinking out loud, although writing has that same aspect to it. And, and his issues are more about, in terms of speaking and belief, and, and in terms of abstract belief, or I, I would say Christian confessional beliefs, his issues are more in terms of lying. Pastors say manipulative things they don't actually believe, they don't actually live out. And again, I think that's, that's, that's to a great degree true. Um, one of the things that, that working through the Bible does is make you a hypocrite, because pastors preach all kinds of things that we struggle to live out ourselves. But all of us do that, and I think that's in terms of the dynamic of speaking, I think that's part of what speaking is for. Now, now, now we want to get into Jordan Peterson's God, and this is where I'm going to get into the history of the Christian God, because this very much matters to the debate, especially in terms of philosophy, how Christianity and philosophy kind of stalk each other. And again, I recommend um, Philip Carey's um, Religion and Politics in the West, that he does has on the Great Courses series. You can get it on Audible. Uh, I've gone through that once. I'm going to go through it again. It was a very helpful series, and he just kind of walks through all the stages. And if you don't have a lot of education in that, um, that that college course that Philip Carey um, offers is is really a nice introduction to a lot of pieces of it. Now, Peterson's God is not a simple thing to figure out, and that's because most of us listening to this are deeply nested within a modernist realism framework for our assumption of who and what God is. And this came out most clearly in the Dillahunty conversations. This is why we don't, this is why he isn't simply being coy or withholding when it comes to this question. Same with his conversation with Tim Lott. His answers are very consistent over time. You can find this in the 2015 transliminal conversation. He's beginning with some competing definitions of, um, let's begin with some competing definitions of God or the gods. And let's give some, let's give some terms so we can track what defin definition of God we're using. Um, this is also a problem with the celebrity atheist debates. And so when, for example, Bar Ehrman and Sam Harris sit down, well, even though Sam Harris, um, what is he by training? I can never tell. Is he a podcaster? No, he's a he's got a PhD in, uh, in something. And again, a number of you have said, ah, but he just got that. What he really wants to do is what he's really doing. In other words, don't look at what he believes, look at what he does. Bart Ehrman is a New Testament scholar, and he's, so if you look at the world I live in, Bart Ehrman is a well-known New Testament scholar, partly because of his shtick, and, and his shtick is, he was a fundamentalist, he got into that, so he went to Moody, which is a dispensational organization, so again, in Christianity, we have all these little factions that we know, just like politics, he began in Moody, then he went to Wheaton, and then he went to Princeton, and if you know anything about the Christian landscape, you go Moody, Wheaton, Princeton, well, kind of the inevitable thing will happen, will happen. And, and that's what Bart Ehrman has done. And to a certain degree, Bart Ehrman's public career 
has been this his his shtick. So in in some ways he's he's a good match for Sam Harris, and they're they're working the same project from two different angles, which is why Sam Harris says so many um, complimentary things for Bart Ehrman and why they agree on so much. But if you look at it through a particularly religious lens, you might say, oh, they're so different. But if you look at them through a philosophical lens, you would say their project is, is pretty much the same. Now, this is an outline for this longer video, because this is going to be a very long video. So the truck drivers and the car riders and the people who like to put this on while you're gardening, you'll be happy. Those of you who want something fast, you know, listen to it in segments or just, you know, find somebody else who's putting in fast graphics and Jordan Peterson destroys things. We're going to look at the polytheistic roots for the Hebrew world. We're going to look at how the Hebrew prophets beat empire and polytheism, which is matter and gods, which again gets into this question of the resurrection. How Christianity subsumes the Greeks. Now I'm going to use this word subsume often because this is a word, if you look at, say, Hegelian um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, when something subsumes something, what they do is they're able to kind of integrate it and accommodate it and make, make a way for dealing with it so that you can, in a sense, move past it. And that's why you're going to see this word subsume often, because this... You know, I'm not really a Hegelian, but this this word is important and this word is helpful for figuring out the relationship between Christianity and all of these stages that it has passed through in its history, in the history of God and Christianity. Will Christianity survive its own created its own creation of secularism? That's Nietzsche's um, that's that's Nietzsche's assertion, and this, of course, is where Peterson jumps into the argument pretty strongly. Will Christianity keep mutating culturally and not lose itself? That's a really big and important question. And if you look at Christianity, so we're looking basic, we're tracking basically three things. We're tracking the religious, we're tracking the cultural, and we're tracking the philosophical. And we're going to talk about politics and history too along the way. So here we go. I might break this up and do it in small chunks because I've got an appointment in an hour and a half. Let's begin with the Greek gods. Let's begin with ancient polytheism. And of course, not all polytheism is the same, but we're going to spend most of our time on the Greeks and the ancient Near East, the Mesopotamian, and to a certain degree, the Egyptian context. Well, the Greek gods are sort of like superheroes today. And, and there was a movie with... There was a movie with... There's a movie where, where, which was basically a Greek, uh, a Zeus slash superhero. What, what was the name of that movie? Why can't I think of it? Ugh, frustrating. Anyway, it'll pop up in the comments section. In many ways, our superhero movies, we're, we're doing what the Greeks did with their gods. And now it's, it's very interesting how we're doing it and the ways we're doing it. And, and in fact, in the Marvel Universe, you, you actually have a, a polytheistic god who is Thor in a polytheistic universe. And so it's very interesting how, in some ways, the Marvel Universe continues the Western tradition of Greek gods, because this is kind of what Greek gods were in, in antiquity. Most were not self-existent or eternal. They were born. And you can find that again and again in, in, in Greek mythology. Now... The God, the Christian God, has no beginning and no end, and we're gonna we're gonna have, obviously have to run into Platonism to find some of this, but also the Hebrew Scriptures, because that's an area in which they agree. They inhabit the same world, but were more powerful and didn't necessarily age, die, or decay like we do. And again, you can find this in the superhero universe. You can find it in Thor doesn't age. Well, Odin does Thor age? I don't know. Uh, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman is living a long time. You can even find it in Tolkien with, with Aragorn's slow to age and Gandalf. So, so you've got some, you've got some of those elements. Uh, they, they want, wor they wanted worship and obedience, but they were often like petty politicians or vain celebrities. Again, you find that in in Greek mythology, and, and they're not necessarily moral exemplars. And, and so the, here's, here's a little bit of ancient polytheism. Now, 
you get more into the ancient Near East perspective and the gods, again, with all of these, the gods lived within the world. And, and you often had some big gods that, that were kind of more derivative gods, but, but the gods that, like Marduk, that Peterson will talk about, these gods, these gods were born at some point, they developed, they had their, their hegemony, they were, again, kind of like superheroes. Some of the ancient Near East gods were a cut above the Greek gods. And I think Marduk is probably a cut above Zeus, and, and you can hear some of that development when Peterson talks about Marduk and how he relates to the political, so on and so forth. And they, but they did live within a competitive political economy, and their patronage was sought after, but they could be defeated and replaced or subsumed. And Peterson talks about how polytheism over time tended to move towards a monotheistic type type situation and there's a lot of speculation in terms of the hebrew god you know the tetragrammaton yahweh the lord the the hebrew i'll just i'll just use the lord the the hebrew god and and what his roots were because you have questions about you know the consort um asherah there's a there's a lot back there and if you want to read some of that you can check out for example uh John Walton's books, and, and Zondervan's actually has a, a background, a really excellent background commentary on the Old Testament, and John Walton was the editor of that. And If you're interested in the relationships between the, the culture of the Bible and the surrounding cultures of Israel's cousins, because they're, you know, Molech is a cousin, or Molech, Moab is a cousin, Ammon is a cousin, the Philistines are, are intruders who come in. Edom is a cousin, because Edom, of, of course, is, is Jacob's brother. And, and part of the way to understand the book of Genesis, which Peterson didn't go into much, is the book of Genesis sets up the world for the covenant relationships that are going to come in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so that's why the relational importance between Jacob and Esau, between Lot's two sons, um, ben Amin and and Moab and and how those relationships impact the story of the Hebrew scriptures and you know these things endure because later when you get into the book of Ezekiel for example when the Babylonians come in and destroy the temple in Jerusalem and Edom cheers and mocks well then God has an oracle against Edom because they didn't stand with their brother so you have kind of an ancient Near East uh, ethical norm, which is, you know, yeah, we can fight within the family, but nobody comes in and takes on our family. And, and so you have all these layers in the Bible, and you have all these layers in the story. And obviously, Peterson, even with two-hour lectures over 15 times, you don't, you just scratch the surface of a book like Genesis, which is, so, so this is the ancient Near East polytheism. And, and again, Peterson goes into Marduk and talks quite a bit about this in his lectures. Now, now the Hebrew God, the Lord, Adonai, Yahweh, in many places in the Bible, the Hebrew God is, re is presented in a way that is um, recognizable in that context. Now, some Christians, and, and this is in a sense what the kind of thing that Bart Ehrman is is complaining about because you'll tend to find this in fundamentalist circles a lot of fundamentalist circles imagine that the bible basically drops in from heaven now in the past i've talked about mechanical and organic inspiration organic inspiration which is the dominant view of inspiration through the history of christianity so it says that god moves through history to and the holy spirit inspires the scriptures through history and that's different from islam where you know, an angel tells Muhammad to write the scriptures. It's different from, it's different from the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, where there are seeing stones and, and, and Joseph Smith, you know, dictates it. In the Christian tradition, the, the scriptures come out of the culture and the milieu, and they're also inspired. It's below and above, and, and that's part of, that's part of why, as a Christian, I can talk about below and above in terms of the Bible. The Bible represents culture. The Bible has human fingerprints on it. Now, it doesn't. That's not 
Christianity has not seen that in competition with inspiration because the God of redemption is the God of history and God is sovereign and God is providential. And so God moves through history and God shapes history. And this again, read John Calvin. He'll talk about this, but read Martin Luther, read the church fathers, you know, this, but there's always a tension between above and below when it comes to the Bible. And these things, of course, get get really stressed when you get into the modernist fundamentalist fight in the 19th and 20th century. So in many places in the Bible, the Hebrew God is, is represented in a way that is recognizable to that context. That's also fundamentally important if you're going to have the the scriptures not only be understandable by people but be understandable by neighbors which is a big deal in terms of the old testament method uh, myth missiology in the bible now sometimes people say well i want a book from above well right away you've got a problem if you have a book that's falling from above because what well, language is it going to be in once you once a book is in human language you cannot avoid human culture. You cannot avoid the kinds of things that come in with language, the ways that language shapes our thought. And, and in that way, Christianity has always been very cognizant of culture and unlike, very much unlike uh, Islam, but I would also argue unlike Judaism, it's part of the reason Christianity has been so capable of infiltrating other cultures. And, and the question is always with Christianity, does it lose the thread? And this, of course, if you look back on my Sola Scriptura sermons and some of the other places where I talk about the Bible, this is this, this is this question about the Bible and can and why the Bible is so important as Christianity goes transcultural. Islam, for example, doesn't believe that the Quran can, can really be translated out of the out of the Arabic and so there's a deep tie and if you really want to be a good Muslim you should Muslim you should learn Arabic and read the Quran in its original now as a Christian minister within my tradition there's a high value of learning Hebrew and Greek so you can study the Bible in in you can study the Bible in its original languages but Christians don't generally say that translations of the Bible into other languages are not themselves the Bible. So right there, you have a degree of cultural, you have, you have a degree of cultural translation and variability that Christianity tends to accommodate in ways that even, even Judaism, that the emphasis is on learning the Torah and reading it in, you know, in the Masoretic text. And you know, observant Jews out there can correct me where I'm wrong with some of these things. But but Christianity is much more transcultural in that way, because every time you translate the Bible, you interpret the Bible, and you're having to use different cultural categories. But the Hebrew God and all of the elements of the Old Testament, again, if you take a look at John Walton's um, Zondervan's background commentary on the Bible, you'll see Walton goes into exhaustive details in the ways that sometimes the, the, the elements of the Bible are understandable within the cultural framework, and sometimes the elements of the Bible are in contrast to the broader cultural framework. The Bible preserves the history of progressive revelation. In other words, the Bible has multiple cultures within it. The Bible doesn't say, this is biblical culture. Now, if you're in a church, you have to try to construct a biblical culture, but no church construction within time is the biblical culture. And you'll hear this in Tim Keller's sermons always, that, that the Bible critiques all of our cultures. And so there might be some ways that, that some cultures get things well, but fall short in other ways, and so on and so forth. The Bible, the Bible preserves the history of progressive revelation within it. You can find, if you're a careful reader of the Bible, layers of the progressive revelation of the Bible. And part of this is the history of polytheism in the context of the Hebrew Scriptures. God inhabits a realm rich with other gods or powerful spiritual beings. And you can often find these references most clearly in the part of the Hebrew scriptures that are called the writings, as opposed to the law and the prophets. 
the law, the Torah, the first five books, the prophets, all the rest of the books except for the writings. So if you look in, for example, the book of Job and where Satan comes and God has a casual conversation with Satan and Satan seems to be a court official within God's cabinet. Now, you can find references like this in the Psalms and a number of you have pointed to a an Old Testament scholar who has done a number of videos on this. I can't remember his name right now. Again, I should put these things in the PowerPoint. Sometimes I think of them as I'm talking, but someone will point that out in the comment section too, because this is one of the resources that some of you have pointed me to him. And he actually does work in the Logos Bible software, which is the software I use. And he does work in the, um, he has his own books now. But there's this, in a sense, there's this pantheon, and they're rather shadowy in the Old Testament. They're definitely there in the text, but how the different cultures deal with them is different. So if you were very much from the ancient Near East and you'd read that, you'd feel very much culturally at home, and we tend to call these things henotheism. And you can find these in the Psalms, one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 18, read it. Um, you know, you've got God with smoke coming out of his nostrils and he's coming out of the sky in a chariot. And he's got, you know, a Greek might look at this and says, well, he's kind of like Zeus. Um, a Babylonian might look at this and say, he's kind of like, he's kind of like, um, you know, I can't even remember. It's early onset Alzheimer's. He's kind of like Marduk, although I've always been absent, absent minded as my father and my grandfather were. He's kind of like Marduk. The Egyptians could kind of locate this in their pantheon. So in the ancient Near East, Psalm 18 would be very recognizable and very powerful. And now what secularized people do, if you read Missiology, for example, uh, now I can't remember his name, but there's the excluded middle that missiologists will, will often talk about because as Christian missionaries went into other cultures, they recognized that most other cultures have angels, demons, spirits, this whole middle realm. And, and I dealt with that to a degree in my work with the Haitians, this whole middle realm. In the West, we tend to have a high God and then the people down below. It's, it's a two-tiered system. Many cultures in the world have three tiers at least, and usually it's a hierarchy of sorts. So to imagine the Lord seen as the high God, and then there are other spiritual beings, and then there are, then there are people. Again, this is why I say that Pentecostalism isn't, Pente Pentecostalism is fundamentally a culture shift in Christianity more so than necessarily a theological shift. Now, there are theological ramifications for that culture shift because they always are, but Pentecostalism really is a part of Christianity that is rich with the middle, and, and this is part of the reason why Pentecostalism has spread so quickly around the ancient world. Yeah, people come to the door when I get interrupted. Hopefully I can keep my train of thought. Now, the Hebrew God, there are always ways that this God and his and his works are different from Israel's neighbors. So, and again, Walton does, John Walton does quite well with this. And he's got books that are both more geared towards pastors, and he's got books that are more geared towards laypersons. And so John Walton is a helpful is a helpful guide in some of these in some of these issues. But there are ways that this that this God and his neighbors are different from Israel's neighbors, rivals, and imperial imperial conquerors. The most ignored part of the Hebrew scriptures for most Christians are some of the most fundamental parts of it in this area. And what's interesting is that Ezekiel, Daniel, these these books have kind of been appropriated by dispensationalism. I'm not going to go into a lot of conversation about dispensationalism. I'm not a dispensationalist. Dispensationalism arrive, arrives out of the modernist fundamentalist fight in a need to find a literalism in the Bible that is a product itself of the modernist fundamentalist fight. And if you've listened to my past videos, uh, you can understand kind of where I'm coming from in there. So... And some, some Christians are going to have issues with some of the things I'm saying here. That's just the way it is. Uh, 
Remember the scriptures are multiple books written over a long period of time. Now again, I believe in organic inspiration. So God works through history and culture and times and the individual circumstances of people's lives. I'm a Calvinist. I've got a rigorous understanding of providence. And I know it was actually the issues of suffering that drove Bart Ehrman from the faith. It wasn't the biblical studies, and and Ehrman, I, again, I, I really appreciated the Sam Harris Ehrman conversation. I, I thought it was a very honest conversation. I thought it was a very productive conversation, and but Ehrman is quite is quite upfront there about the the elements of his deconversion from Christianity, and and so now you know as as we look at this, there are cultural elements to that. There are philosophical elements to that. There are moral elements to that. And again, that's why in many ways he and Sam Harris are, are really on the same page. But I'm a Calvinist. I believe in organic inspiration. So God moves through culture and history. And, and theology is the work of not destroying the diversity in the canon while also maintaining its unity. And I know some of you out there are fans of Peter Enns. Peter's been on his own journey, has have many of what are now have now become known as the progressive evangelical tribe and there are there are political connections to that there are cultural connections to that there are theological connections to that but but what theology tries to do is you look at this canon which again I'm a I'm a Christian reformed pastor so the bible is inspired by the holy spirit i tend to prefer um, i tend to i prefer the term infallible to inerrant, which I might get into a little bit later. Inerrant is connected with the Chicago Inerrancy Conference. And I remember reading that statement in seminary and thinking, this just isn't going to work. And I, I don't think it fundamentally works. I'm much more in the Bible is infallible. There's a there's a fun little book written by um, I. Howard Marshall on this. There's a lot of books written on this. So if you're interested in this, that's a vibrant debate within the Christian community in terms of what words best describe the faithfulness of Scripture and what it's for. Again, I don't want to get too far into that, but I know that for many of you out there trying to figure out the Bible and your own faith and what you can do, the Bible is a big deal. And that, again, is, is part of the, the modernist, fundamentalist split that happened. And there are a lot of different camps within Christianity. And again, I thought Ehrman was very candid and honest about how he described these different camps and different Christians. But theology is the work of not destroying the diversity of the canon while also maintaining its unity. And I think if you look through over the history of philosophy and the history of theology, you'll find that project continues. Origin was trying to figure out, okay, what does the Bible mean? But he was working within a cultural context, and he's working within a philosophical context, and that's why Origen has this allegorical interpretation of Genesis, for example. Zoom ahead to Augustine, less heretical. Augustine has his Neoplatonism. He has his biblical work, and Augustine worked through the Bible a lot, and we've got a lot of his sermons and writings preserved. But Augustine also then would kind of default to the allegorical in ways that it couldn't work in other ways. And this is, this is a long part of Christian history. Now, the Protestant Reformation, and especially what follows the Protestant Reformation, strongly critiques the allegorical. Because, now again, this gets into the philosophy of the Enlightenment, the quest for certainty, the doubt in texts, and again, I've talked about this in my previous videos. This then becomes part of the process by which we get to this modernist fundamentalist fight where we're trying to figure out, well, how does the Bible talk? And in, in many ways, we're still in that fight today. And, and if you listen carefully to conversations about the Bible, if you hear the word genre, you know we're having a conversation about how to read the Bible. Well, we have to respect this genre. Well, how do we deal with Psalm 18, where God has smoke coming from his nostrils? And he's, he's riding the clouds. And in my tradition, we have a, a wonderful hymn. It's one of my favorite hymns where, where you just envision God 
coming down out of the sky, parting the heavens. And again, this feels like a superhero movie. This is the, the adrenaline rush we get when this being of power and majesty comes and he wants you. And he's there to save you. So, so suddenly the mythic and the personal meet. And that has real power for us as embodied human beings, as emotional human beings. And again, as we go through, we're going to talk about the different layers and why Christianity works in ways and has been so successful as opposed to other religions that have petered out along the way. So theology is the work that is, is the work of not destroying the diversity in the canon while also maintaining its unity. And, and sometimes critics of the Bible will we'll say, yeah, but there's it says this in one place and it says this in another place. Yeah, it does. And honest readers of the Bible will say, yeah, it does. So what is theology? Theology is this layer above the Bible. So in, in, my, in my tradition, you have the scripture, then you have the confessions. And what the confessions are, are fallible, changeable, changeable, communal layers by which we lay our cards on the table and say these are the ways that we these these are the ways that we understand the bible these are the ways that we interpret the bible and and so that's in a sense a theological layer and so the bible we're working with the same bible that augustine had we have better texts we know more about the ancient near east we have better handle on the languages than augustine had but we're working with the same Bible as Augustine, and we're doing theology. And, for example, this is a progressive project. One of the things that Dillahunty says is, you know, religions don't change. And I hear that, and I think, you're out of your mind. Religions change all the time. Religions have layers of church history, and it's a continual process, and it's a continual project. And, and sometimes we go down a road, and it becomes a dead end, so you backtrack, and then you try another road. This is kind of the nature of communal theology and what happens in the church. Now, different cultures find access to different things that they need. We get, we, when we take a look at, for example, Genesis 1 through 3, now, again, another little point. The Bible is not a book written by one person that begins in Genesis 1 and starts writing all the way to the book of Revelation. That is not the, what, the kind of thing that the Bible is. The Bible is a library in many ways. And these books were written at different times. And many of these books, especially in the Hebrew Scriptures, have a long history behind them. And careful readers of the Bible have noted this. Most of the Old Testament books are, we don't know who the author is. Now again, in Torah, there's Mosaic authority. And there's a tradition of Mosaic authorship. But almost everyone has admitted that Moses didn't pre-write about his death in the book of Deuteronomy. A careful reading of the Bible a careful reading of the Old Testament scriptures will note sources in them. And you can find this, for example, in, in Kings and Chronicles, where they are referencing the annals of, of, the, of the kings of Israel or the kings of Judah. You will also notice that you will find some things in multiple books. And so you know that there's probably a layer of literature that was being passed around, or at least there was an oral history of things that were passed around and then the, the the versions of the bible that we have are the product of that work there's also for example the different translation traditions and if you pull a modern bible off the shelf they the the scholars that put those bibles together are looking at especially in the old testament well okay what is the you know, do we have a copy of the, do we have a translation copy of this in Greek, the Septuagint? That's about the first century. What's the date of the Masoretic text that we have? Are there any Arabic or Aramaic translations of the Old Testament? Because some of these old trust, some of these books were made with earlier versions of the text that we don't have access to so reading some of those translations can be helpful in trying to figure out what biblical scholars sometimes call the autograph or the original version of the text but again that's difficult to get to because we know that the text is layered and again as a 
Christian Reform minister in the Calvinist tradition. I don't have a problem with that given organic inspiration that these texts, the Holy Spirit guides through time. And in fact, you can hear Bart Ehrman make reference to this. Now, he being a modernist and no longer a believer, he classifies himself as an agnostic, does obviously cannot embrace an idea like the inspiration of the Bible because this is this is part of the package that he got rid of when he deconverted. I don't know. I think you can talk about this. You can maybe give evidence for it, but there's no way to prove biblical inspiration because that's that's not an element. That's not the kind of information we simply have access to. Genesis 1 through 3 um, presents the Lord as the God of singular importance and presence. One of the things that one of the things that if you read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and you read it against, let's say, Babylonian myths or Egyptian origin myths or other origin myths, the Genesis 1 is very monotheistic. They're, you know, let us make, you know, you've got the the Elohim, the divine plural, but that's a really big debate, and I don't think anybody quite knows what that means because Genesis 1 is very much monotheistic and you've got a God and you're not making other gods and you've not got God's birthing. This is God bringing order out of chaos by his word. And of course, Peterson talks a lot about that. And this will then get connected with John 1. But the, Gen the God of Genesis 1 is of singular importance and singular presence. And the Lord is unrivaled in power and importance, even though the canon doesn't necessarily dismiss what Israel's neighbors would call the gods. And this, this actually gets mentioned in the, the Ehrman Sam Harris podcast. This gets into henotheism, which is the idea that there's a pantheon out there, but God reigns supreme over it. We've talked about that a little bit. We'll continue to talk about that. This is something that I think you can see when you get to the Apostle Paul, where you have principalities and powers. Now, Paul is a fun person to study because Paul, on one hand, is a Pharisee. We know his political faction within Judaism. We know who he was. He was highly trained in one of the best Pharisaical schools, and then he converts. He wouldn't probably use the language of conversion because what he is persuaded by is that Jesus is risen from the dead and that he then does the work of a theologian going back over the Hebrew scriptures and figuring out what the resurrection of Jesus means in terms of the story of Israel. And if you want to read good books on that, read N.T. Wright, who has done a ton of research on this. Now, what also makes Paul interesting is that Paul is of Tarsus, which is a city where Roman citizenship is conferred upon those born there. So Paul is also very accustomed and Paul is also very adept at living in the Hellenistic Roman world, which means that he knows, probably knows some Greek philosophy and he quotes some in the sermon on Mars Hill. He is aware of the Greek and Roman cultural landscape. The degree to which he's conversant in those philosophies, that's something that's debated by biblical scholars, but he's certainly not ignorant of it by virtue of, of what an effective missionary he was. And you'll hear Bart Ehrman in that podcast talk about Paul. N.T. Wright just has written, recently published a biography of Paul that I haven't read yet, but I am um, eagerly anticipating getting to. The problem is that this project has just completely blown up my book list to ridiculous proportions, but I continue. So we do we have elements of this henotheism in Paul's principalities and powers? I think we do, and I think N.T. Wright talks about that well, that, that what Jesus does in the crucifixion and resurrection is Jesus triumphs over the principalities and powers. And so you have this, this middle realm is very much there with Paul. Now, 
going back and we anticipate Jordan Peterson doing his biblical series in Exodus. Will he? Won't he? He, he told me personally in my little interview with him that he, he very much wants to do this, and I completely believe this. It might just be in his best interest to ride the book tour as far as it goes and then pick up the biblical series all depending on if he's got a plan and what his plan is for his life. Again, I don't think it's political. I think it's religious, social. I wouldn't be surprised. Now he's got the money. He could buy a church building if he wants to and doesn't have to rent out the theater. But the problem is his popularity is so large, that's likely uh, pointless as well. well. Maybe he will. I'm sure there's plenty of church buildings available for sale in secular Toronto. Maybe even a pastor would let him use it. Um, uh, Phil Reinders out there at Knox Church in Toronto is a good friend of mine. So there you have it. The Exodus stories are a study in Israel's theological combat versus the Egyptian system. And I think Peterson, with his background in mythology, is really going to go into this. Because when you look at the plagues, this is combat. The Lord is seen as serially dismantling the empire, empire Egypt's gods and their supposed claim on governing the natural order upon which human life depends and Egypt's imperial ambitions rely. This is a strong theme in the book of Exodus, and I would argue it's it's there in the book of Genesis as well, where, where the Lord basically laughs and mocks the Egyptians' God. Now, this also begins to set up a long theme in Scripture, which is the theme of empire. It's important to think about the difference between kingdoms and empires, and persons in the world in the time where the final version of the Old Testament books that we have received were, were molded, which there's huge debate when these books arose in the version we have, it's, it's clear that Israel's exile was fundamental to the shaping of the character of Israel that we will especially find when we get into the, the second temple period, which is the temple rebuilt in in the Persian Empire period. But there's this long conversation in the Bible with respect to empire. And, and this is critical in the Hebrew prophets for reasons that I'm going to get into. And this theme will be translated and carried all the way to the end of the book and is very strong in the book of Revelation. Now, my friend Jonathan Peugeot uh, keeps saying revelations and it's driving me crazy. Jonathan, the, the name of the book is Revelation, not Revelations. Revelation, it's the translation from the Greek, Apocalypse. So it's the, the Apocalypse, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. But this theme about empire comes through, and some of you have picked that up and commented and, and critiqued and sometimes criticized me for bringing up empire. Well, what is an empire? An empire swallows kingdoms. Kingdoms are kind of these tribal groups, familial groups, a kingdom may be one city, and if you read, for example, the, the stories coming out of the book of Samuel, this, this area is a patchwork of all these tiny little kingdoms. You look at Abraham and his, his great wealth and his number of servants, he takes on kingdoms. Now we hear that, we think, wow, well bear in mind, kingdoms might be a few hundred people. Because it's a king, it's basically a tribal warlord and his kinship group, there's a kingdom. But as history goes, these kingdoms get, get larger. You can see this in the story of Israel itself. They are 12 tribes, and when they want to have a king, all these tribes need to get together. And so that's a big deal. They, they take Saul, and then David is from Judah, and so the, the transition between Saul and David winds up being a civil war where you have Judah against Benjamin, and Benjamin, despite its size, is no pushover. Saul was from Benjamin, but the whole story in Samuel about the transition from Saul to David can be seen in the light of, of tribes and kings. And so David becomes a king, and then really David, when he subjugates the surrounding cousins, he becomes an emperor. He becomes a king of kings, and he becomes a lord of lords. And you can see this process in the history of the ancient Near East as, as it goes through time. Empires get larger and larger. And if you read, say, Yuval Harari in, in his fascinating books, this process of empire is an important one. 
the United States, again, I would assert, is an empire. It's an interesting kind of secularized modernist empire that dominates through trade, although the U.S. continues to have the most dominant military on the planet. This, this is the American empire, the empire. Um, and it prefers to reign through other means. But when Saddam Hussein, for example, breaks out of his boundaries and invades Kuwait, well, we want to get the United Nations behind us, but nobody's really at all confused about who's doing the conquering and who's enforcing the law. And that's, in a sense, why Donald Trump's brand of, well, we're going to let the, we're going to let NATO pay for itself and we're going to let Japan pay for itself. And th this is why this is so unnerving, because in a sense, Trump is anti-imperial, as, you know, some libertarians have been, um, Ron Paul. And um, so anyway, a little bit of politics for you. But this empire conversation is important because in many ways, one way of understanding the claims of the Bible are competing empires. And one way of understanding the kingdom of God is imperial. And you see this very clearly in the book of Daniel. And some of you are making your way through my Daniel series in my, on my church channel. My church channel is separate from this channel. I do have a line here of church work, but if you go to my church channel, you can find a bunch of old stuff. And you can find my going through the book of Daniel. I just finished the book of Ezekiel. I'm now going to jump into the New Testament and do the epistles of, of John because I spend, I've been in the book of Ezekiel since July last year. And my Sunday school class is a very rare breed of Bible study that can handle, that can handle staying in an Old Testament prophetic book for just that long. But for me, it's been tremendously helpful in terms of piecing all this together. And a lot of this has happened while I've been doing the Jordan Peterson stuff. So if you listen to my Ezekiel studies, you'll find a lot of Peterson stuff in there because, you know, the, the watchers are watching and the noodle is working. I need to keep my eye on the time. So in many ways, one of the ways you can understand the Bible are competition between empires. And so, for example, in the book of Daniel, when the Ancient of Days sets up his throne and the Son of Man comes with the clouds and he's given an eternal kingdom, Jesus uses this terminology, Son of Man, to describe himself. And that's really sneaky and subversive because there's already a King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the first century, and his name is Tiberius Caesar. And this, of course, is so those who want Jesus dead and want the Romans to kill him go to the Romans and say, this guy has imperial aspirations. You should kill him. Pilate looks at him as like, oh boy, imperial aspirations. He's not following the mold. And there were many supposed messiahs in the day. And you could, in fact, include Herod the Great in there in terms of his reconstruction of the temple. But there were many who tried to build an army and they were going to free Israel. And one way of understanding Ezekiel and the Old Testament prophets is that they imagined that Israel herself would become the dominant empire in the world. Now, if you understand that and you understand some current, some current Near East politics, it gets really interesting. Now, if you throw the dispensationals in, who, again, is a modern fundamentalist tribe that arises out of the modernist fundamentalist split, their hyper-literal reading of Old Testament prophecy then gives birth to a Christian eschatology that demands things like the the mosque on the Temple Mount be destroyed and a new temple be constructed. And you can even find some of my Reformed cousins called Reconstructionists barking up this tree and imagine that animal sacrifices will be reinstated and so on and so forth. And this is a weird way in which some, some factions within Judaism and some factions within certain aspects of English and American Christianity, and some of this has been popularized overseas too, kind of come together to be a, a little bit of a, a, a unhappy merger politically because they both support a certain brand of Zionism. Boy, this goes all over the place. But that's the way these conversations go. So the Lord versus Egypt is 
God kicks the stuffing out of Pharaoh and the Egyptian, the Egyptian pantheism of gods and basically says, I rule the world. And then he brings Israel out into the desert. Now, the imperial crisis that happens in the story of Israel and in the history of Israel is a huge one. And again, watch my videos on Daniel and Ezekiel on the Livingstone CRC channel. And you can find a link to that on, on this channel. And I'll, I'll put a link to that to that channel in these notes. Israel and other small kingdoms are dismantled by empire. This is the this is the nature of empire. They gobble up and destroy. You can see that in the beasts of the book of Daniel. Israel herself had a local one for a while under David and Solomon, but the Lord's plans are in a way imperial too. The Lord must have dominion through Israel. Jerusalem will be the umbilical of the world. I just dealt with that in the book of Ezekiel. You can John Walton points out that for the Babylonians, Babylon was the umbilical of the world, and Marduk was the imperial god, and this then was validated by Babylon's destruction of these empires and subjugation of these destruction of the Assyrian Empire, subjugation of the Egyptians, subjugation of Judah so on and so forth. That validated Marduk's imperial claims. And so Marduk was reigning over the world from Babylon. Now, of course, Persia will come and topple him. And the Persian, Persia had a very interesting way of, of trying to secure its metaphysical patrons Persia was more in favor of letting a thousand flowers bloom. So the emperor of Persia, Cyrus, would send the Jews back to Jerusalem and say, rebuild your temple. Now, Cyrus is the servant of the Lord in the book of Isaiah. This is an astounding thing. Well, why? Jonathan Peugeot says Jordan Peterson is a Cyrus figure, which, which is fascinating and clever, and I think there's a lot of truth to it. But, but Cyrus then imagines, well, let's have all of the temples fully functioning. Let's have all of the, you know, it's kind of King Arthur, King Arthur and his knights, but it's not necessarily a round table. Let's have all of these, let's have all of these gods come fully online. And, and you might say, well, the empire is stronger if everyone is happy religiously. And, and you can find echoes of that in some ways in the secular approach to religion that the United States takes. And, and whereas early on, slave, slaves, states could have official religions. And so what was the official religion of Massachusetts? And what was the official religion of Maryland? And what was the official religion of Pennsylvania? And what was the official religion of Virginia? But already, and then you have um, Roger Williams in Rhode Island with his religious liberty, then in a sense he got from the Dutch, and read Shorto's books on New York and Amsterdam, and so on and so forth. So the Persians do it a different way. But the imagination continues to be there in terms of the question about politics and religion, which were really one thing in the ancient world. And you might argue they continue to be one thing, despite America's experiment in separation of church and state. Is it separation of religion and state? Does the state then become a religion? So, so this, is, this, is, this is an imperial crisis, though, for for the for Israel when she is conquered because the way the script goes let's see that if that's in my next slide yeah here's the script empire in the ancient near east gods the script is human kings were clients of the gods and you can see this in for example Hammurabi's code if you go and you look at the stele you find the god giving Hammurabi the law well what do you find in the book of Exodus the lord giving Moses the law the 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 human leaders are clients of the divine leader. And again, Peterson will talk about that in some of his lectures before. But what that means is that war between clients reveal the relative powers of their patrons. So there are wars in the heavenlies, and there are wars on earth, and they line up. Well, what does that mean for Israel and her God? The Lord becomes a bottom lobster, and Marduk becomes a top lobster. Now, 
part of what's helpful to understand about polytheism is, is one way to see polytheism is it's an adaptation of religious pluralism. And this is a continual conversation today with respect to religious pluralism and offense against Christians and historic offense against Jews and offense against Muslims, the Abrahamic religions. And almost every time you hear someone talk about the Abrahamic religions in a non-religious context, they're basically saying these religions don't play nice. Well, why not? Because these religions are not polytheistic. Remember when I talked about the word subsume? The question of polytheism is already built into Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And you can find that, in fact, in the, in the origin myths of Islam. Now, I don't mean myths pejoratively, okay? So I, I don't mean that to offend. But if you, look at, if you look at, let's say, the Islamic interpretation of Abraham, already Abraham is dealing with other gods. And this is important in terms of of the story of Muhammad and Mecca and polytheism that was continued to be practiced in the Arabian Peninsula. I don't know a lot about that history. I know a little bit about it, but maybe I'm ignorant. You can correct me in the comment section. But but this but what polytheism does in a context like the Roman Empire is avoids religious conflicts. So well here here it works like this. I might have a family god, the god of the Vanderclays, and we have a little altar in our in our clan. And so to be a Vanderclay means that we we have the gods of the Vanderclays. Okay. So then but then there's the, the god of the city that I'm in, and I want to be a good citizen of my city. So I go to the temple of that god too. And then there might be an imperial cult. And so I'll go to the, the imperial cult of the dead emperor to show myself not only a good citizen of, of, of Ephesus, we'll go to the temple of Diana, but I'll also pay homage to the Roman, the Ro, you know, dead, you know, Caesar Augustus, because I don't want to run afoul to him. So I've got my family god, I've got my city god, I've got my imperial god, but then let's say my wife gets sick. Well, then maybe I'll go over to the healing cult and, and I'll look for help there. Or maybe, you know, I don't, we don't have uh, Viagra, so maybe I'll go to the temple of, of Aphrodite because you need a little help there. Or, you know, or maybe I want my business to flourish and everybody says, well, this God is really helping me for business, so I'll go to that God. Now, this is in a sense... Religious pluralism lubrication. I can get along with my neighbors because they have a different family god, and they're not really up on the city god, but they'll they'll show up. They're still a little sore about some political things, so they'll ignore the other god, but they're really high on this god over here. And so, basically, religious pluralism and polytheism helps people get along. And you will continue to hear that argument today that Christians and Jews and Muslims, they don't play nice, they don't play fair. Maybe some reasonable ones will, but if they're really fundamentalist, you know, they that shouldn't be allowed. We should all, and, and then you hear this with, say, some Eastern philosophies, we should all get along, we should all we should all recognize there are many ways to the mountain. To say Jesus is the only way, well, that's just offensive. That's anti-pluralist. Well, polytheism had this built into it. And these Abrahamic religions have dealing with polytheism built into them. The downside of polytheism is you lose your narrative thread. That it's one God to another God to another God to another God. You lose your identity. Why have Jews, Christians, and Muslims been able to maintain their identity? And you could argue that Hinduism is really a name that comes about when the monotheistic English colonize India. Because is it one religion? Or is it many religions? Or is it a kind of religion? Or is it an abstracted religion? What happens, and again, this is really critical, and, and, and walking slowly through the Old Testament prophetic books is very helpful with this. The Hebrew prophets flip the script here, and, and similar to what they did in the creation story. And that's why the whole Hebrew scriptures are, you know, are prophetic books in that sense. The Lord governs Israel's imperial overlords. Now, this is 
I, I would imagine that the, the Jews in exile are whispering this one to another. But that's entirely what the book of Daniel is about. This is about Nebuchadnezzar thinking that, yeah, my gods have conquered, but the Lord is above them. Okay, this is where you have henotheism. This is where you have monotheism developing. The Lord is above those other gods. And Nebuchadnezzar thinks that his gods are in charge, but oh no, the Lord is above that. And if you read the book of Daniel, you'll see that the first seven chapters of the book of Daniel, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel are all these series of ordeals. These are trials. And, and, and in these trials, the question is, who is stronger? Israel's God or the gods of Babylon? And you go through the book of Daniel, and Israel's God triumphs each time. And the story of the book of Daniel is that Nebuchadnezzar becomes temporarily enamored by the God of the Jews. And, and that's what the book is about. You see this clearly in Daniel, but it's present in other places too. Israel was punished. Now, now you have this whole you have this whole question. And, and Peterson gets into that. So the temple has been destroyed in Jerusalem. How do you interpret this in terms of your metaphysics? What does this mean? Well, you have some choices. You could say, Marduk is greater. I'm going to go to Babylon and join the Marduk cult. And certainly some Jews do that. Or you say, what are we to do with our God? Are we to give him up? Or do we to go to the monotheistic route? And some Jews go that way too. And they become the polytheistic route. Some Jews go that way too. Say, well, we'll, we'll keep the Lord as our little family God. But when we're in Babylon, we'll, we'll, do like the, we'll do like the Babylonians do. Well, pay attention to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace and the image that they refuse to bow down to. That's a story about this group of Jews saying, we are not going to become polytheists. Now you read the Old Testament, you read the book of Kings, you read the book of Chronicles, you read the book of Ezekiel. Why does God, why does the Lord bring destruction on his own temple and put his own mission of reclaiming the world at risk? It's because of the polytheistic practices of his people. Right there, you see the conflict. And, and polytheism is, taking, is taken head on, and it's a denial. We will not be polytheists. We will not bow to other gods. You will kill me before them. And, and so some Jews probably go the Babylonian way. Some Jews continue the polytheistic way. Some Jews dig in, and they say, nope, we're not going to do it. And you can find this, you can find this thread throughout the entire Old Testament where the Jews dig in. And you would argue that the Old Testament is written by the faction of the Jews that dug in and said, we ain't going to do it. You can kill me. I'm not going to bend. Now, that is a powerful thing. And what this does functionally is flip the script on the ancient Near East religious assumptions. And, and in this way, Israel is remolded and recast. And now you might say, well, that's kind of a, that's kind of a strange anomaly in the history of religion. Ah, oh, yeah. And it's extraordinarily powerful because if you add the number of people that are Christians and Muslims and Jews, even if you're a secularist, you have to sit back and say, that idea is powerful. That idea has come to dominate. That idea is, seems to enable those who have it to colonize nature in a way that the polytheists never have. So Israel was punished for being polytheistic. That's very clear in the book of Ezekiel, but won't be destroyed if she holds to the covenant and God will come God will complete his work through her God will complete his work through God will complete his work through Israel I got someone calling me God will complete his work through Israel 
Now you have this pattern in the Hebrew prophets where there's admonition and warning for covenant obedience. Other ancient Near East prophets admonish and warn regarding cultic compliance. You can find a prophetic tradition, for example, in the Babylonian and Assyrian tradition. And what the priests keep nagging the people is, come to the temple, give your sacrifices, do your offerings. If, if you people don't give your sacrifices and do your offerings, then Marduk isn't going to bless us. It's very transactional. Um, my kids for a while were playing this computer game, Age of Mythology. You build these little temples and you have all these little worshipers and they're all worshiping by the temples. And that gives power to the gods. And, and if you find uh, American gods, if you read that novel, uh, this is kind of the same idea that, that somehow these gods develop, and you can, there's various different names that have been given to it, these gods develop energy and power by the worship that's given. This is kind of a little scientistic reinterpretation of mythology. Well, so, so the other ancient Near East prophets and priests would say, well, you've got to come to the temple and you've got to do this. Now, what you do outside the temple, eh, eh, God can be flexible on that. Now you have the beginning of two-speed religion, which I've talked about before, where, where there's a speed of the temple, you know, the, the speed of the temple, the, the priests, the monks, but then there's the common speed. And the common speed is very transactional. Give the God what he's asking for, and the God will give you stuff in return. I call this common religion. We might call this folk religion. And, and this is an aspect that will be in any human population. And you'll often hear secularists critiquing it. You know, oh, you know, people only go to church to give their money to the televangelists because they want to be blessed. Yeah, this is part and parcel of human religious behavior and it's trans-religious and it's nearly universal and it's you'll find it you'll find a layer of it in christianity and and now secularists will say well i, I don't buy any of this stuff and and maybe an atheist will say i don't need any of that religion well here's the problem that atheists have looking at it even from a secular point of view Many, many people, this, this transactional, common, folk religion layer in us is very deep, and it's very universal. And almost in almost any religion you find, you will find that layer. And religions that try to exclude that layer do so at their peril, and it usually spells their destruction. So, but this layer is critiqued in, by the Hebrew prophets. And, and so this, again gets subsumed within Christianity, because you'll find this layer in Christianity, and you'll find it endures, and, and you'll find this layer gets integrated into even a Christian like C.S. Lewis, very observant, very faithful in his tithes and offerings, very faithful in his worship, but nobody's going to critique Lewis as being some simplistic transactional religionist. Other ancient Near East prophets were far more transactional in terms of their ambition. After the fulfillment of destruction, which is the day of the Lord, they give their hope. The prophets begin talking about restoration and fulfillment. And you'll find that in Ezekiel. And you'll, you'll find that in Isaiah. And you'll find that in Jeremiah. And you'll find that's a common feature in the prophets. But one of the things that the prophets do, the, the Israelite prophets do, the Hebrew prophets do, the Jewish prophets do, is that they will hold people to account in the covenant. And, and they will say, well, offerings, the Lord loves offerings more than sacrifice. What does that mean? It means, should you fulfill your cultic obligations? Yes. But the cultic obligations stand at the heart of a faithful life. And now we get into the roots of one speed versus two speed religions. And we get into the roots of some of the tension between the Protestant Reformation um, and the Catholic and Orthodox which maintain their two-speed cultures. But again, when you get into Protestantism, it's a one-speed thing. John Calvin wants to have a holy city. The pilgrims go to the New World to establish a city on the hill, which, again, you can find in the book of Ezekiel, which has a temple on it. They want to have a city on the hill, and, and the Plymouth colony is going to be a the kingdom of God on earth. And what that means is that you have laws that are obliging people to do religious things. Now, what happens in the patchwork of the American colonies is that that then gets fractured, 
And so, okay, Massachusetts can be their city on a hill. Roger Williams wants his city on a hill, but he's going to have religious liberty because it's got to be voluntary. The Quakers go to Pennsylvania. Some of them will be in Rhode Island. You've got a split, so you have Connecticut formed. And, of course, you've got other Anglicans and Catholics and other places in the Americas. Not a lot of Catholics, mostly Anglicans because it's a British colony. Anyway, there's a lot of history in there, but all those layers are built into our system. In the Hebrew system, basically, Ezekiel says at one point, what happens in the temple gets played out in the streets. This is a very sophisticated idea that wasn't as present in, let's say, the Babylonian or the Assyrian. Make the God happy, he'll give you success. You've got broader terms. From the Hebrew prophets. Now this is an audacious move on the part of the prophets. Now I don't know if it's been tried by others but no one is but but no one else pulled it off in the ancient Near East. You, you would imagine that with all of the different tribal religions, Edom, Moab, the Philistines, you know, all the uh, everyone else getting gobbled up by empire, and especially groups getting perpetually gobbled up by empire, by Egypt, by Babylon, by Assyria, by the Persians, by the Greeks, by the Romans. You would imagine there were other stubborn people who said, we're not going to worship your gods. But we don't know about them. If we find any record of them, that would be an interesting thing. But here's the crazy thing about the Jews. They pulled it off. In Sacramento, I don't find any temples to Marduk. He ain't around. Well, Christians are around, Muslims are around, Jews are around. They pulled it off. This was an audacious move, and they pulled it off usually at the cost of their lives, certainly at tremendous cost. You might say, well, that's stubborn, but Israel survived in a way no one else did, and this is a remarkable fact however you feel about Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, this is a remarkable fact. This is an incredible accomplishment in terms of human thought. If you're looking for evidence, like I said, there's no temple to Marduk in Sacramento. Probably not in the United States. Probably not in the world. This is also a costly move, and, and it makes sense of the suffering of the Jews. Now, I think I'm going to pause here because I've got my appointment coming up and people are trying to get at me. So when we get going on this, we're, when I redo this, or when I start this again, we're an hour 20 into it, we'll pick up at the second temple.